I am Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on June 15th, 2018. In this special edition of Call to Coach, we'll spend some time investigating the experience, emotion, and empirical aspects of each element of the Gallup Q12 engagement instrument and to know how to increase the power of our coaching as a primary driver of success. If you have questions during this webcast, just uh, down down below there, there's a, a chat room there. Love to have you log in, bottom left-hand corner. Choose the guest account. Take that guest in the number out. Put your name in so we know who you are. Hit submit. We'll be taking questions live during the program if you're listening to the recorded version. Or if questions about custom strengths coaching solutions for your organization or any others, you can send us an email. Send it to coaching at gallup.com. Put there, uh, put the content, or there's a contact form on the live page you can use as well. Don't forget, you can visit the Gallup Strength Center for all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs. You can also catch the video, downloadable audio of this program, as well as all the past ones that we've done. We make those available as podcasts. You can find them on our coaches blog, coaching. .gallup.com. If you're listening on uh, Apple or an, uh, an iPhone, you're probably in iTunes. You can subscribe, rate, and review right there so you get these things automatically. If you're in YouTube, easy way to subscribe. Uh, YouTube's made that easy. Bottom left-hand corner, I think it's yeah, I think it's down there. It says subscribe, hit the notification bell. You'll get notified every time we go live if it's the live channel or when we uh, post it if you're on, the, on our regular um, channel. Or if you're listening on Spreaker, you can follow us over there as well. Mike McDonald is our host today. Mike works as a senior workplace consultant here on the Gallup campus with me down on the riverfront. Mike, always great to have you and welcome to this call to coach. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, it could not be more excited to talk about engagement. I yeah. am a, I was, I was thinking about this um, while I was making fun of myself as I was thinking about this, but um, I, I, I love the whole student practitioner model around engagement, right? You, you can't learn enough and you can never do enough when it comes to thinking about culture and how we can how we can actually understand the mechanics and move culture forward. So if it doesn't cause you to come alive, then um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what else we can do other than maybe throw some strengths into the mix, right? Uh, no, so, right on. Yeah. Right on. This is a series I've had in my head for a long time. You came to me and said, we should do this. And I said, how do we get it done? We'll be doing the next 12, uh, not including this one. Today's a kickoff. We're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, a little meta mm -hmm. today. And then um, we have 12 each question we will we'll, we'll cover. We didn't plan a, 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 you know, a wrap, a season wrap, and we probably will. We'll probably add one more to this to kind of wrap it up. I'm sure there'll be a few things we want to do there. Mike, we want to get to know you a little bit. So a little quick intro of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but one point about that wrap, Jim, I'll be really interested in the audience's reaction and guidance. Uh, I've prepared a, a bit. Uh, I have input and in learner, so I, maybe I should maybe I should introduce myself that way, right? That'll help explain maybe everything else that I say on the other side. So yes, so I've prepared uh, a little bit, and there might be a little bit too much, and maybe we do carry that over into a wrap. But what I would say is just so you all, as coaches, uh, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware here. Um, my top five are ideation, input, learner, achiever, and focus. So. Uh, I love studying things and then I love doing things and then studying those things some more and then doing those things some more. So I'm a pretty easy read, um, easy to figure out. But I've, I've worked for Gallup for uh, just a shade over 28 years now. Uh, and so I, I like to bring that perspective, quite frankly, Jim, to the conversation because um, I, I know that space and time in the eight years, uh, at least that I was here prior to and throughout the evolution of the Q12 and the understanding of engagement that Gallup has now. So uh, to be part of that perspective and, and have some of the insight in terms of what that experience was like, I think uh, brings some, some relevance to the table. Um, my role right now, um, well, I'll, I'll go back to 1990 when I started. I, I came on board as a go-to. Um, and I think that's those are managers for people it, who don't speak Gallup speak managers. Yes, we say go to, but good point. Those are managers. Good point, Jim. Yeah. So, uh, a team leader manager, and that's the one constant thread that, that, uh, I've operated around through my entire career. I've had a variety of different specialties and, and other jobs where I've always led a team. And I guess where this gets really personal for me, as I was sharing earlier and, um, and I guess maybe for context for the group, is that I, I, there were things that I tried really, really hard that I thought were the right things for my team, and they were the absolute wrong things for my team. And I get real, I guess, just sensitive or, or um, personal about how many, how many well-intended team leaders are there out there right now that are working really hard 
as hard as they possibly can and as hard as they know how, but they don't have any coaching or any context around the structure of engagement, what it is and how do you lead through it and to it. And how do they as leaders, because of their strengths, how do they connect and lead to engagement in a way that's powerful and natural for them? And so I've been on both sides of the coin um, and I would prefer that nobody else goes through the trial and error experiences to get there. We're smarter than that. We're better than that. We have a diagnostic like engagement to get us there to a better place. We have coaches now who are sophisticated and powerful and, uh, and have expertise to get us there. So we have a whole different reality, I think, to get us there. But anyway, to fast forward up to where we're at now, I'm a senior work workplace consultant um, with Gallup. And so I still get to lead a team who goes out and works with clients. But, uh, but as you can imagine, the nature of our interactions is how do you build a better workplace? How do you create a great culture through the combination of strengths and engagement? And the one thread really throughout that is coaching, right? We just, we, we not that we're trying to escape the nature and the, the notion of coaching, but it gets reinforced throughout performance, throughout engagement and strengths time and time again. So it's great to be here and, and bring all of that to bear and learn throughout the entire process. Uh, it's great to have you. We know that strengths in the context, I think strengths are infinitely more powerful. They are very powerful on their own. Mm -hmm. They're infinitely more powerful in the context of a measurement called Q12. Are these, and there's no magic there. It's just 12 questions. I'll, mm -hmm. I will bring those up here in a second as we kind of think later on, we're going to kind of highlight them uh, this time. Uh, and then we'll dig into each one of those 12 questions. But um, Mike, what do we hope, what do we, what are you hoping to accomplish through the next yeah. 12 sessions as we're together? Yeah, uh, no, that's a great question, Chip. So the the first thing I really want to do, and and again, the whole the whole consistency around the the reason we're all here is is to bring to bear the the importance of coaching really in the translation and the self awareness that particularly leaders of teams need to have if they're going to be effective in driving engagement and performance on the other side of engagement through their teams. And I think you know we when we talk about where we're all at our best, but maybe where we ought to have some boundaries where we can lean into our strengths and all of the all of the application, that leader self-awareness is uh, critical. And we've got empirical research that will demonstrate that. We'll speak to it a little bit later on. But we just know if that leader isn't in tune with the people that they lead and the culture they're creating and the performance that's expected on the other side, nothing happens. And, uh, and to have a coach who's co-piloting and stretching and developing and causing that leader to be the best of who they are as they lead their teams in the right way, uh, authentically and genuinely um, is a game changer. And so that's that's one point uh, of an outcome. And, and again, you all know that, but I'd like to highlight it and continue to reinforce that through the perspective of engagement. The other thing that I think is um, that I'd like to deliver on is, is hopefully to add some, some different angles or aspects of a coaching acumen to what we already know about great coaching. Um, but just tweak it a little bit to, to apply it to what does it look like when we coach to and through engagement um, towards outcomes that matter. And so when we think about what those outcomes particularly can and should be, I'd like to deliver those really through our discussions, right? Through our 13 sessions. And there's three points particularly that I'd like to land on. And, and the first is really the empirical, that I think the empirical matters to us, certainly more to some, some members of our audience than others, but to some degree it matters to all of us that this is empirical truth that we're talking about. It's not just Jim's good idea or Mike's good idea. Mike and Jim had a crazy idea one day and then they thought they had to go tell people about it and prescribe it to them, that it's not that. Um, but why? What, what do those numbers tell us and how does that matter? Um, we know that matters to some leaders, right? There's some leaders who really respond to the numbers and the math and their, their world makes sense out of them that way. So I wanna make sure that we have a good foundation there. The other part though that I think, again, being consistent with engagement is, is engagement is predominantly emotional. It's all about the emotions that cause us to behave differently that create different outcomes. And accumulate those. The stories I always tell about myself. When, um, so when I first started working at Gallup or before I started working at Gallup, Everybody at Gallup comes in and they, and they take a, a kind of a psychometric test, right? To figure out, uh, do we really have a job that, that your talent deserves? Um, do we really have the right thing for you that you deserve? And so we're always making sure we're really conscientious about doing the right things for, for people when they onboard. And one of the questions in these tests was, uh, when you're faced with a challenging decision, how do you approach that? And, and talk us through the process. What's, what's, what are you thinking when you do that? And so uh, again, for this audience, you'll appreciate, I think, this story because empathy is my number 34 strength, okay? And now this is pre-strengths finder. So I'll, I'm just, this is just, just raw instinct uh, in response. And so my answer to that question was, I thought 
at the time, probably the best that they'd ever heard. For sure, the standard. The listen fours were all over the place. And I said, Jim's laughing because I think he's heard me share the story. But the point is, I said, here's what you do. You extract and siphon all the emotion out of that decision. You just take it all, strip it all out, and then you just break down the empirical progression and linearly put it together so you arrive at a really great outcome and decision. Perfect. A plus, five stars, spectacular. So now as I sit here before you and tell you this today, that was the biggest F uh, grade-wise that anybody could ever deliver, right, on, on any answer to that question. Because obviously you can't, emotion is everywhere. And what we really want to do when we think about engagement, and I think this is where coaching is so important, we never want to get rid of engagement. We never want to get rid of the emotion. What we're really trying to do is to actually capture and create the most positive, powerful output that that emotion is, is created to actually do. And so that's the release of coaching. That's what that's that's the alignment with great managers when they get put in the right spot. So the emotional just can't be missed. So you can tell them my story that I've learned my lesson, at least to the best of my abilities, as I as I um, go through and make different mistakes, but not the same old um, mistake by trying to extract emotion. And then the third, I think uh, maybe is as important for as anything for us is as our own credibility is is um, I think uh, a priority is just the experiential, right? There, that we have some space where we can uh, resurface some memories. I just shared a story. Maybe some of the things that we'll talk about, about enga with engagement will, will cause you to think back to where are you most engaged? Where are you actively disengaged? And I think if we were to be transparent, we all have been there, right? We've all lived in each of those three categories. We'll talk more about what they are represented to be. But we've, we've not been everybody's best friend at times. We've actually been uh, part of the problem and not part of the solution at times. So anyway, those are three. If we do this well, I think those three points we leave with, and we've got a lot of evidence around each of those three that causes a coach better. Mike, what I love about strengths and why I think it's so awesome is that it gives us this framework, this consistent, defined, scientifically-based, tested framework from which we can all have very similar conversations with each other, about each other, managing each other, helping counseling, all those kinds of things, right? It gives us a common language. What I love about Q12 is it gives us that same framework, except for engagement. How do you feel about what you're doing? Whether it's engaged in, in, in work, engaged in a church, engaged in your individual job, engaged in anything you're doing. Like we have, we have seen these engagement questions be answered for tons of different things, right? Gallup Purdue index that we have for students is based on these Q12 questions, right? Scientifically, we're going to talk about that here in a second, but scientifically based, tested 35 million people, some, some uh, this amazing framework, right? And so it allows you and I to have a conversation that can be exactly the same, even though we're in different spots, yeah. right? Because we have agreed upon, defined ideas of what does this mean? Right. And so for, for coaches who spent a lot of time around strengths and you've, you've said, yeah, this gives me a common framework, the, the Q12 and its system and its, and its questions gives us all this, again, this common framework for engagement. We're going to spend a bunch of time talking about that. Mike, we have some resources, though, we want to share up yeah. front because I think we have two of the world's best kept secrets in two books that are available. Can you talk about those? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, I, I really want to draw our attention to a couple of uh, reference points that I'll be using throughout our series. And so the first one is, is uh, again, a, 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 gosh, what we say, a foundational understanding, uh, almost a, a do not pass go if you're thinking about leading a team um, a resource, but it's the first break all the rules. Uh, this book came out and it was really the first one to step into the study and understanding of engagement in the way that we understand it right now through those 12 elements. Uh, but the book does a, a great job of really giving enough of the empirical uh, confidence level uh, confidence building understanding, but it gets into some stories, just some stories and examples of why those elements matter and how they matter. Um, one piece that Jim and I really want to make sure that we um, accentuated in terms of what you have at your disposal with that book, beyond the book and all the power that it really contains in terms of such great insight, is that we've embedded uh, two codes, two codes, um, one of which we're very familiar with, but there's a strengths finder code in First Break All the Rules. Um, so there's access, right, for somebody to take that, to take, to take the assessment and get their top five strengths back as a result. The other code is to take the Q12. And we'll talk more, obviously, about the Q12. I don't want to make too many assumptions, but where a group of 10 people can assess their workplace around those 12 items. And so I think for us as coaches, we have a really great resource at our disposal that not only educates us about the concept and structure of engagement, the science of engagement, but also really creates a powerful invitation and opportunity 
for a leader to learn about their strengths. So now you can step into that role as coach, coach that leader, expand their self-awareness, and also, depending on the size of their team, having had their team take the Q12 and have those results is that performance outcome, that performance mirror that they can look into and your coaching can help bridge the gap between who that leader is and what their team does and how can that be maximized in the awareness and application of both. So, yeah. so that's and, one resource, Jim. Yeah. And Mike, that code is super important. I think that's we didn't do a good enough job of okay. selling it on that. And in, mm -hmm. And that's the, the value in that there's, I mean, there's a lot of dollars wrapped up in those 10 seats to do this, this very first Q12. You can, if you're a coach and you're working with a leader, you can, they can purchase that book. You can purchase it for them. And in that, have them take it and have them have their top five, as well as administrate a Q12 administration to get a baseline, right? Where is your team at team members? That 10 number, we started looking at what's the average team size. It kind of fits nicely in there. Most organizations, it's between five and seven on a team. Um, and so again, gets you in there. A lot of people didn't know that those, that seat, those, that, that, you know, kind of the trial version, so yeah. to speak of it, is out there for you. And first break all the rules. Uh, enormous value there. We have another book though, Mike, talk a little bit about that one. As well. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the kind of the uh, companion piece to it, um, not intentionally positioned that way, but, but it's worked out that way is uh, 12, 12, the elements of management. And um, 12 is really, it, it, it's, it's a, it was a great effort on Gallup's part where our chief workplace scientist, Jim Harder literally went around the globe and it's, it's really the qualitative version of First Break All the Rules where it's just filled with stories that really demonstrate the range uh, and representation of engagement um, in every kind of workplace, uh, in every corner of the planet. And what you really find in there is, is the core to each element, that there's a consistency about it, but it has infinite possibilities based, about, based upon the relationships and the talent and the application of the, the leaders that are on display throughout that book. And so for, for a lot of us, it really brings those elements to life where now it's, and I, and I think this is important as we coach through engagement, is to not just, these aren't items, right? They're not items, they're people. They're human beings who are doing things. And so one of the things I really love to have us think about our coaching is um, just some simple questions like, so, so which of these elements is the most important to you and why? Now all of a sudden it's not an item anymore. It's a person who has a motivation behind it and a need that that motivation has um, and a desire to perform as a result of that claim around that particular item. But, and even as we talk through the 12 elements, I will challenge you and invite you to, um, and probably don't need to do either one of those things, but you're gonna have faces and names of people who are gonna populate all around each of those 12 items and really bring it to life. And, is, and that's important, right? When we think about building a culture, it's, it's people, it's not Q10 or Q4, but it's people who are actually connected to and representing those. Yeah, so, yeah. and over time as well. So yeah. good, so there's some resources. You can pick those up and follow along in the series with us if you'd like to do it available in the Gallup store. Uh, many of those are available on Amazon and just check your local availability. I know I'm going to get some feedback from folks around the planet where it's harder to get these resources. I get that. In some countries, it's just hard to get them. We'll figure out or, or figure out some ways to get that done uh, for you. But at least here in North America, Amazon, some of those outlets that are available for you out there. Two great resources to have on your shelf. I have a couple different copies of them uh, as well. Yeah. Mike, in two minutes, give us a quick rundown. What's the history? Why, why yeah. did Don, how did, how did this fit into the Don Clifton and the system and strengths and why is this important? Yep. Great call. Um, yeah, I, I was really interested going back and just in going back to ground zero, right? When did this all really first start? I, I've conveniently placed and, uh, placed myself and thought about it in the context of me, but, um, Back in the 30s, even when in Dr. George Gallup started uh, the Gallup poll and really started thinking about asking questions around the planet in an infinite variety of topics. Uh, we know this, right? Religion and, and uh, the workplace and, and government and, and all sorts of social issues. Um, he was asking questions about the workplace um, back then and, and, and has decades of examination of the workplace and the role that it plays in a life well lived. And we I even found a, a reference point that he had in 1976, where even then he was reporting that uh, only or that not 50 percent of the United States could say they strongly agree with the work that, or that they strongly agreed that they work they get to do was um, was meaningful. Right. So already we've start to see the seeds of, of questions being asked to promote and provoke thought around what engagement looks like. Um, that rolls up and then we start to see this um, alignment then with the work that Don Clifton 
is doing. And I know I don't need to go into a lot of introduction about Don, but you know, when, when we think about Don's world-class decades long pursuit in the study of excellence and success, we obviously know that he discovered talent as part of the explanation strengths as the application of talent towards performance. Uh, but he also, in that pursuit of excellence and study of excellence, came to understand that there's mechanics, right, within the dynamics of a culture that accentuate and amplify strengths towards performance. And so there were conditions that really, again, um, multiplied that, that, that talent predisposition. So if I'm a superstar performer, but I'm also in this environment, there, that, that effect is not small. In fact, it's multiplied many times over. So you have this contribution from Dr. Gallup where it's crafting great research questions applied with Don's behavioral mindset around what are what does decision making look like in a great culture? What do relationships look like in a great culture? And so in 1998, when the two or when in 1988, when the two companies come together, you see the 90s really be represented by Don's leadership and crafting with other scientists coming together and studying and understanding and pruning down to what are the exact questions that indicate a positive, powerful environment that promotes performance through the strengths and abilities of its members. So in 1998, 1998 we arrive uh, with the actual 12, the 12 items that we have in front of us right there. And so Jim, that brings us up now then to the other side of that discovery to where we've got now decades of application of the Q12 and the study and understanding of what, what actually happens then when you put these items to work and start to make sense out of them. So, yeah. I made a pretty bold statement uh, earlier that I don't think you can, I, I think you struggle sometimes with strengths. It's there by, by itself. It can do a lot, but it can be exponentially driven when we begin to measure with, with engagement. But let's ask that question, or let me ask that question. What is engagement? Like, mm. how do we define it? Why does it matter? What's important about it? Those kinds of things, the empirical that yeah. you mentioned. Let's start with that. Uh, in, in the time that's remaining, let's dig through these three questions. Yeah, nope, that's great. So I think that I think the, to start off with is um, how did we arrive at those three questions? And the main thing that I think from you, from a coaching standpoint, is is they matter. These twelve items matter because of three specific reasons. One is they're empirically correlated to the predominant business outcomes that are that are um, broad and represented for almost every organization: turnover, profit, productivity customer satisfaction, safety, quality, and, we, and the list just goes on. The, the trajectory or the direction of all the outcomes that we want to have happen, turnover going down, productivity going up, are all represented and relate, related to engagement. We can get into more details um, if necessary, but stand on that because that matters. We can stand on that as empirical truth. And that's what was part of the screening process, which were the items that truly mattered. The second part that really mattered in those 12 items is the fact that they they separated high performing teams and low performing teams in in terms of their ability to respond to those questions. So for example, and we get this a lot when we think about one of the items and we'll talk about this later on, but it's it's best friend at work. I have a best friend at work. Very controversial question, but very powerful in what it represents in a culture and a workplace. When we tested that question, we were hearing lots of different references to relationships being important, important in the workplace. Um, and so we tried different iterations of the of questions to capture that, that essence of relationship. I have a good friend at work. Nothing separate or distinct about the ability for a low performing group and a high performing group to answer that question distinctly. They were equally likely to say yes or no to that one question. But when we really spiked up the intensity around best friend, then it separated high performing and low performing. And so that was an exercise that every single one of the 12 items that was arrived at really had to go through. They really had to prove themselves through that separation. Um, and then the third, uh, again, for your point of, of application, is that these were all items that, that could be locally influenced, that the team could actually own and do something about. So while there might be other attributes of engagement that could be measured, if they were beyond our span of influence or control at the team level, um, they really aren't of much use to us. So for your focal point when you're coaching with team leaders as they think about engagement, I think that's an important perspective um, as they separate what's within our span of influence and control, but what does what do we need to set aside or what do we need to come back around to later on? Or how does that, maybe that involves the organization making different decisions, et cetera. So, so empirically, we can stand on those things, Jim. We can know that all 12 have passed through those screeners and, and uh, have been found tried and true. Um, so, so we can take those on through. I think the other thing um, 
that's important in our research, it's consistent with strengths as we as we went through and looked at this, is the language. And Jim's brought, been really great about bringing up the point about the language, the language and what's represented, not just quantitatively in strengths, but but in the concept of strengths is cons or the concept of engagement is consistent around the planet as well. And I I'll, I'm going to cheat and use my notes here, but we just can we just completed our most recent meta analysis where we went back through and just reviewed everything about it, all of our engagement research to make sure that we were accurate with those twelve. To date, Q12 has, has been administered to over 35 million people, but more, maybe as importantly, across 198 countries in 72 languages. And again, I think for confidence, it, just like strengths, it's not situationally contingent. Best friend translates around the planet. Opportunity to do best translates around the planet. And I think we need to have that at our disposal if we're to coach effectively, because um, it's dangerous, quite frankly. If our coaching is, is um, centered around an, an assessment or either strengths or engagement where the situations cause those to be different um that can be dangerous right that, that, that's an unstable space for us to be helping people in mike one of the things that's really important i think is these don't just become labels where we say the team is or isn't but that they have some very definitive action items they they really allow um, managers to be able to do things on the other side. Can you talk a little bit about the action side of it? Because I yeah. think sometimes I say this on the strength side, we fall into a name it, name it, and name it culture <laughs> where all we do is, you know, activator is this and woo is that, and we split hairs on the definition of it. But we know as strengths that the real power is in action. How yeah. is, how do you see this as we think about actionable items going forward for, t for, for managers, for teams? Talk yeah. a little bit about that piece. Yeah. Well, I think for, uh, from the perspective of a coach, is it, it's, a, it's an interesting space because I think when you're coaching a team leader, you, you, you almost have to envision the team on the other side of that team leader. That as a coach, you're coaching that team leader and coaching through that team leader into their team. So yes, you're creating awareness directly to that team leader, but when you think about the outcome or the end goal of what's right for that team on the other side, I think it shapes and shifts the coaching um, exchange a little bit between you and that team leader. And so Jim, to get to the point of your question, what it does is there's a cascade effect of how your coaching models what those questions and answers look like and what that relationship looks like so that that team leader can then go on and have that same type of engagement oriented exchange where they're asking better questions, the right questions that really promote and produce performance out of that understanding and that shared discussion that they've had with their team, their team member. And so I think there's a different outcome there that, that um, is present in that coaching exchange with a coach and their team leader and, and the result of that. The thing that I think uh, that gets into those mechanics, Jim, or those drivers of performance, and again, going back to this audience, I think is just the ability to ask better questions and the right questions now that we had before. And when we think about the, the 12 items of engagement that we'll speak to um, specifically here, those are questions that, that can guide and govern um, conversations. I think about this a lot that I think you can make the argument that, that a culture is the, the combination of the content of the conversations that are had within it, right? So just think about, just think about the exchange of, of conversations. And if you were to just audit um, 30 minutes worth of conversation in an in a organization's lunchroom or break room, uh, or a team meeting, I'll bet you'd have a really good pulse in terms of what needs to be coached and what their culture looks like. I was, um, my wife used to work for a really large organization. And one summer they had the check off the box, big company picnic, right? We, we've all seen those and, and they're, they're epic in their stereotype. And, um, it was amazing. Uh, huge production, lots of money spent. But what was also unfortunately amazing is I sat around, um, I, I kind of wandered off and, and made friends with some people or introduced myself to some people and, and, and was kind of listening in on conversations. Um, the entire group, the, the entire company was there collectively and all they did was rip on and bash their organization. I'll bet they, Jim, I'll bet they spent tens of thousands of dollars on this. It was massive. And I thought the irony of it was they spent a ton of money and it would have been so much better off had these people never had the opportunity to get together and to ever have any kind of exchange. They, this, 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 it was just a critical mass of negativity and active disengagement. So my point then is we can change our culture through the coaching, through this lens of engagement, because we'll have better conversations that are not zero sum, 
that are with the intention of bringing out the best of people, but there's performance at the center of it. And that's the thing about engagement. What I love about engagement and strengths is we never talk about one without the other. Engagement means nothing without the performance. Strengths means nothing without the performance. And when we put performance at the center of those conversations around engagement and strengths, all of a sudden, um, it uncouples that that personality preferential style of delivery. And now I don't care, Jim, how we succeed. You and I know we just need to succeed. Hey, if you've got great stuff that helps us succeed, I love that. I think I've got some things that help us. But it's not this, again, zero sum, Jim gets to win, Mike gets to win, battle for control or um, preferential delivery. One of the things I really appreciate about it is in, with strengths where we try to focus on those things where people are best. We can approach, you know, you've done those employee engagement surveys where you try to, you, you cherry pick the scores to get the best ones and you sweep the rest of them under the rug and hope nobody sees them, right? And yet each of these 12 elements has our ability to say, where are we doing well? and what, what are we doing best at? Where are we really exceeding and excelling? And, and, and how does that fit into the performance metrics that we're trying to do? And then where are our opportunities for us to be better? And I think this is where strengths plugs in and yeah. says, hey, we can do better in these areas. Un unlike strengths, we really want to do best in all 12 of these elements, right? Yeah. This is one of those things where you really want to say, where can we, how can we move these scores? And I think strengths has the, is, has the insight. It has the keys. It has the, it's the beginning conversation of, hey, who do we have in the organization that can really start tackling, whether it's best friend at work or know what's expected of me or materials and equipment, there are people who are uniquely talented and gifted to be able to move those scores for your organization, mm -hmm. identifying them and moving them as we think about moving into the experience part of it it, it. it it really does bring kind of a new element to it. One of the things um, it also does is separate teams. So high performing and low performing or highly engaged and low engaged teams from a larger management perspective, that is gold to mm -hmm. be able to go into, you know, you might oversee teams of, you know, managers of teams of managers. <laughs> so right. it, go, it's, it cascades down. You don't have the ability to go down to these teams and, and experience where they're at and ask those questions. And you know that manager's probably not giving you the full story. And this really pulls out and separates, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it gives us some really clues to what's going on the health, how they're feeling, how engaged they are. And again, that standard metric, right? Anything else you want to add to that? Well, you know, you, I, I did. Um, one of the things you talked about, Jim, in in thinking about what the engage looked like, right? You had kind of posed that question out there. And I thought I'd kind of tie that back into this, this conversation a little more actively. One of the things qualitatively that we noticed in the mindset of when we're engaged, and I think this is important in your coaching, we would, we would describe engagement as a, an associate who is involved, committed, and, enth and enthusiastic, involved, committed, and enthusiastic. And I think it's really valuable as a framework to think about a team leader and the, I call it the economy of engagement, because I think about this a lot. It's not selfish in this perspective, but it, but it cer certainly puts margin uh, up for grabs in, in a world where we're um, pressed as team leaders to respond or to respond and, and react to the demands of the day. And so when we think about the fact, if we do engagement right, if our teams are engaged and they're involved, committed and enthusiastic, what does the team leader get back in terms of high value, high yield activity that they probably would prefer to be doing and their team would probably prefer them to be doing if they don't have to go around and think about this, if they don't need to recruit people every single day to do the work that they were supposed to do, and not just to do it, but to do it with excellence. Be, now people are involved, right? If they're enthusiastic, it means they don't have to give the, the greatest rally speeches every single day and come up with new inspirational content, right? To get people inspired and motivated to do the stuff that they, in theory, were supposed to do anyway and to do with excellence. Nor then, uh, do they, they have to worry about them being committed, that if people say yes, their follow through is actually assumed and guaranteed, right? And so now all of those things that a manager typically might find themselves reacting to and having to drive after things are broken, after things need fixed, after people aren't getting along, we now have a diagnostic. I think it's a great way for us, honestly, Jim, to, to predict the future of our culture, right? We have a dashboard that we can fly our culture by because we know these 12 things matter and we know if we don't address them, then things aren't going to go well. And so now there's a conscientiousness about it. And I think that gets into that point of application and performance really quickly because the accountability comes to a close very almost in a binary fashion, right? If I don't do this, then this is what's at stake. But if I do this, 
and we win over here. And so I think it really brings it full circle in a way that catches the attention of so many well-intended go-tos who are, are managers who are, who are struggling to find traction, struggling to find a, a foundation to stand on. Mike, the, the questions are really designed to focus on needs. And we're not talking about pool tables and ping pong and right. nap pods and free lunches, right? right? We're really talking about the core needs of, of the, you know, in, in strengths-based leadership, we talk about the needs of followers and, right, these tie kind of into things that I need, things that I need to be able to get my job done. Can you talk a little bit about those needs? Because I think that part is really critical. Yeah, it is. It is. Um and I know you have conversations like this a lot in, your, in the coaching community, but there's each, each strength has a motivational need, but there's a motivational need behind each of the 12 elements that I think really captures that, that emotional um, core to it. And if we think about this, one of the best ways I think to, to kind of lead in, and I think this is a great coaching framework, is I typically will ask people, tell me what your best day at work looks like. And just to have them instinctively respond. Right. So they'll they'll say, hey, it was when I got to do this and I was working with Jim and then it was really successful and other people noticed and et cetera. And, and we got and when and work got done and the, it was important to work, et cetera. But then I'll bring out the point and I'll say. How often does that happen? Right. Maybe maybe unfortunately we can count those best days at work categorically, maybe on one hand. And so I always, I make the point that I, sometimes it's like a lightning strike. You know, it's just this accidental set of circumstances where I just happened to get the chance to work with Jim and we just happened to get the chance to work on this thing. And so it was just this serendipitous type of chain reaction where we ended up having a best day at work. But my challenge is when we think about understanding, to your point, Jim, the motivational needs behind each of those elements, what if we could double what if we could double the number of, of best days of work? What if we could create that emotional answer to that need where we created a super positive, profound feeling that changed our behavior powerfully, that created really amazing outcomes collectively? And so the, 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 the intentionality there, the accountability comes out then is doubling best days. What if we tripled best days? What, what could happen as a possibility? What if best days was just normalized. So when we get inside the psychology of each of those 12 elements, we start to get into these value statements that really helps us mass produce best days at work. So the first one, I know what's expected of me at work, right, Jim? So the, the, the need within that, as we've come to understand it, is to focus me, right? Help me make sense out of this world with a thousand moving parts and simplify it to what my expectations actually are. So think about the importance of that item and that request to focus me in change management. Think about how much change, right? We live in a world where change is rapid. Technology is giving us opportunities, but providing us with challenges simultaneously as we make sense out of a world. Social media, our ability to communicate internally within our organizations and externally, and we've never been more networked as a planet throughout our business platforms as we are now, as organizations as we are now. And so to sense make, to make sense out of through that one element and that request is incredibly powerful. Uh, the next item, for example, is um, I have the materials and equipment that I need to do my job right. And the request there is uh, free me from unnecessary stress. Free me from unnecessary stress. So just think about the tension that we un unwittingly create sometimes where we say, hey, Jim, you know what? We expect you to do this, that, and yet, Jim, we want you to have a great podcast. Super high quality. We want to, you know, the delivery needs to be really tight and everything, et cetera. Um, but we, but but the best equipment we're able to afford for you is a um, a TV camera that we got from uh, that donate was donated to us um, from North Platte, Nebraska. Okay, from uh, from from the station out there, right? So so all of a sudden it's like, well, you can do your best, Jim, but to do the job right, we may not fit that 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 uh, that job right requirement for you as a maximizer, right? So now all of a sudden we can tie a strengths piece to it that starts to flesh out that motivational need and bring it to life. Mike, I love you emphasize, we're, and we're going to dig deep in each one of these questions over the next 12 sessions after this one. And I love those first two as a manager, I live and die by those on onboarding. Mm -hmm. And so I spend a lot of time. It's not just about taking an assessment and, and getting a result back. We, we, I want to do that in real time as a manager with my employees to say, uh, it, it, every day for the first week, do you know it's expected of you? Like, how else can I, like, what other questions do you have? If you were going to, and I say this, one to five, 
<laughs> disagree. <laughs> yeah. Compl- right. G- give me a score right now. What would you tell me? And if they say five on the first day, say you're a total liar. Like, do not <laughs> do that. There's no way. You know, we got to set a baseline. But a really important set of questions that that we're going to kind of dig in. Mike, we do this globally, and I just want to give the coaches some tools when we think about some global numbers that are available. Just kind of talk about real quick here the the global epidemic and yeah. what we see both globally and then for organizations that follow and do this, that work in our Q12, kind of what their scores are. Can you quickly kind of – you know, yeah. summarize that. Yeah, I can. Well, Jim, to your point, uh, we are to, to say we're in an engagement crisis is uh, would be accurate, right? So, by our measurements of the categorically engaged versus those who are categorically not engaged and actively disengaged, uh, we have our work cut out for us. In the planet right now, across uh, Earth, only fifteen percent of this world can say that they're categorically engaged. Um, that's pretty daunting. The U S, uh, we are at 33%. So we're pretty close for contending for the title, but I don't know that I want the trophy for, for being the, the least compromised, so to speak, Jim, you know, and I think we, so I think we should probably keep working at it before we start uh, polishing off our, um, our shelves for any awards necessarily, but across the planet. So, so you've got 15% who are categorically, um, engaged 67%, almost 70% of the world is in this neutral space where they're pretty ambivalent. They could go either way on any day. Um, we've got 18% then who are actively disengaged. So think about that. Um, uh, almost the same amount of people are trying to get really great things done as there are people who are trying to destroy the work of those people who are trying to get great things done. That's a pretty tough ratio, that almost one-to-one ratio right out of the gate. The US, we're at 33%. Uh, like I had mentioned, 50 some percent are, are not engaged. And then we've got about 20 percent that are actively disengaged. So uh, the psychology and what's sometimes, Jim, I'm actually amazed that our economy moves forward at all. Right. That, that anything good can mathematically happen with that kind of content to it. So um, Mike, but I have we've, seen we've seen a bump. Right. I mean, we've we've seen a bump a little bit. Thirty to thirty three percent. It's statistically probably so close. You and I wouldn't claim that. Right. Yeah. But we do see organizations that are deploying strengths and engagement into their organizations. What kind of numbers do we see with them? Yeah, that's where it gets really exciting is that when we, and again, I think an opportunity for us as coaches, we can flip the switch on for that, for that team leader. Uh, and they all of a sudden start doing the right things through their own abilities, through that lens and leadership of engagement. Uh, we've seen organizations double, right? Their, their engagement, um, their engagement percentages. Uh, and and it, what's really um, interesting is we we can see that being done intentionally, right? So it wasn't what the statement is there. It wasn't that that um, that, that organization all of a sudden um, created the iPhone and then their stock price went up and then everybody was really happy. Uh, but then all of a sudden, when that particular piece of technology kind of levels off in the marketplace and the stock price level, I mean, there's not a contingent situation that generates that engagement. The team and or organization can intentionally drive that culture up forward. So we, like, we see these steady climbs throughout where people just continue to learn, apply, learn and apply and stick with their craft to where it's, uh, again, it's that stock that you would want to invest in from an engagement standpoint. Uh, but yes, we've seen teams easily go from that 30 some percentile range to where in our Gallup Great Workplace Award winner they'll be over 70% of their organization will be categorically engaged. I've seen, Jim, I've seen 84% categorically engaged. Just imagine what that culture is. We're almost, we're over eight out of 10 people you're going to bump into today are radically passionate about the work they do and who they're going to do it with. With 35 million assessments taken, that's a lot of industry. (laughs) Do do we cover, would we say we cover most industries at this point? Yeah. In, yeah. In that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, as soon as you mentioned Great Workplace Award, I was actually looking that up and posting it in the chat room. That's so we're it's good. We're you and I are in sync. That's that's great. It. Awesome. That Great Workplace Award. Those are organizations that have to submit packets to us to be their their customers of ours that have to prove and have to you know kind of show that they're following these best practices that we've put out for them and it it's making a difference. It's just not being nice, but it's making yeah. a difference in their organization. Um, that that list, I think there's 39 on the, the most current Sounds list right. or something like that, Sounds goes right. from small organizations to, oh, pretty large ones uh, <laughs> that, that are in there. Um, you can take a look for yourself. But anything else you'd add to the numbers before we move on? Then? No, I think that, I think what it does, though, is, is there's a call to action. Um, engagement can be moved. So now all of a sudden... It's up to us. It's up to our coaching. It's up to our team leaders 
to move it. So we're not victims anymore. And I think that's what's a consistent theme throughout coaching through strengths or engagement is that we move people into that position where they have control and influence. Um, if I don't know what my strengths are, and if I'm not operating in an environment that's engaging, there's a lot of fear and anxiety that creeps into there that really inhibits performance. And that's part of the story, right? That's part of the story that's, that's getting in our way. So we can, we can push that back. Yeah, Mike, as we think in the in the seven or eight minutes that we kind of have left, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the emotional side of this. You you mentioned that uh, early on, and I don't think we talk about this enough. Can you, you know, as we, as we find out, what did you mean by emotional? What does that mean? Well, so I, I, uh, I'll make a connection here. So, um, especially when we think about the combination of strengths. So let's just, let's just marry some stats as we think about the emotional. So Jim, we'll go back to question number one. I know it's expected of me at work. It looks really transactional on the surface, right? That's, that should be so straightforward, just a hammer and nail approach. But yet only 50% of the workforce can say that they strongly agree with that. So right out of the gate, I walk it. So here I am, I'm the average worker waking up this morning the odds are actually a 50-50 coin toss that I don't even know what I'm supposed to do when I go in, okay? Now also, what we all know as coaches is I'm typically not gonna be aware of my strengths or my talent, right? So I don't know what's expected of me, and I don't know if I'm any good at anything anyway, right? And what we also know from our math is that since only 30 per, 30, 33% of the workforce is engaged, here's my math. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, I don't know what I'm good at if I did know what to do. And the one thing I do know is that the workplace I'm going to walk into today, I'm probably going to be surrounded by people who at least don't care about me or actually don't care about me. So I may not know, or I do know that they don't care about me. Either way, think about this. Think about my window of performance and think how strong and how wide that window is open. If I know what my strengths are and I've been coached, that window is here. And I'm surrounded with a great team leader who positions me to do my job well and supports me if I happen to risk or maybe even fail with context. Now my window opens up here. And if I'm surrounded by peers who are naturally enthusiastic and bald and committed about their own roles and we are contributing to each other, that window for my mathematical delivery of performance and excellence is as wide open as it possibly can be, right? But I, when we look at the conditions that we're operating under right now, it's about like that. Like you could, it's like the eye of a needle, you know, for us to get a, a great performance through. So I think when we think about the emotional safe space that we're creating, think about the additive effect of coaching playing out through leader self-awareness, playing out through the strengths that they call into action through their team as they build an engaged culture on out into performance. And we can set off a powerful and profound chain reaction if we just get those coaching conversations right in the first place. Mike, I think some required pre-reading for folks that are going to follow along with us over the next 12 weeks. Um, we have done a lot of reporting on engagement. And so when we think of the State of the Global Workplace Report, when we think of the State of the American Workplace Report, we have done some micro studies on women in the workplace. We've covered millennials that are out there. We've talked about remote teams. We're talking about performance and performance development. We have a lot of material on engagement. If you're a learner, if you're input, <laughs> you're probably going to lose your mind this weekend as you start digging into this. We have a lot of those metrics. We also do some training around this now. And so we've got kind of a program for those, um, you know, we call them strengths champions or engagement champions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about as we get closer to the summit for some mm -hmm. folks listening to this, the summit is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming up at the summit, we have some courses available. Talk a little bit about the offerings. If people wanted to dive deep into that, we're going to highlight this on each session, but what would they do? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So if you really want to involve yourselves into, into a deeper application understanding of engagement, and we've had uh, uh, multiple coaches, uh, lots of coaches have taken advantage of this already. Uh, we have two courses that I think are particularly worth your attention and time to think about. Um, the first is a, an engagement champions course. And as you can tell by the language, this is the ability to get inside the study and expertise and understanding and application of engagement uh, from the perspective of a champion, right? Somebody who can co-pilot, come alongside a team leader and help them understand the mechanics of engagement in a way that translates through conversations on into their delivery and creating a culture where the interactions promote 
really powerful performance. Uh, the, the, the content, as, you, as some of you know, um, of these courses, the materials and equipment, the tools, the coaching conversations all wraps around uh, guides for communication strategies, guide for guides for engagement strategies that collectively generate performance around team level discussions. Um, there's preloaded PowerPoint decks. So it's a train the trainer dynamic, where as you gain expertise and mastery, you're also equipped with a delivery where you can speak to audiences of team leaders um, and have a really sophisticated, sharp, PowerPoint deck with accompanying materials that those managers can have. So uh, it's a really savvy and effective delivery that allows you to create a lot of influence and effect uh, very quickly. The other part of that, that course then is the, um, the training and understanding around another delivery, not just catered towards a half day session for managers, but another one that's more scalable to any audience. And it's, it's a 45 minute delivery about the foundations and fundamentals of engagement that would go out to individual contributors or teams. So we take you through all that mastery, um, uh, an incredible resource, uh, an entire uh, portfolio and, and a box, a whole kit that's devoted towards uh, your abilities as an engagement champion to drive engagement through your coaching and expertise as you align yourself within an organization or within team leaders who, who really want to get serious about that. The other course then too is our leading high-performing teams. Now leading high-performing teams gets uh, more, more literal and manual and closer into the role of a team leader, but many coaches have taken it to get inside the mindset of leading high-performing teams through the lens of a manager, because what the, the outline of the course does is, is the first half of the day, it goes through the strength, just strengths finder, understanding the leader's strengths through their own perspective, but how do they lead their team through the strengths that their team possesses, on into an understanding and mastery of engagement through the second half of that first day, the beginning of the second day goes through more engagement and sharpens that application towards expectations and outcomes. And then we conclude the second half of that second day with five performance conversations that Gallup has studied to understand and identified that are the most responsible for performance development, where we're developing people and growing them in ways that are healthy and sustainable, along with the performance that they contribute that itself is also growing and sustainable. So both courses incredibly valuable and really at the center, I think, of engagement coaching, Jim. Yeah, they're doing some interesting work in that area, and we continue to improve those courses. That's yeah, kind of one of the things real. I love is we're never satisfied. We're a team of maximizers, never satisfied with what's out there, but continuing to improve those pieces as we go. If you're interested in more information on those, you can contact us. Head out to the website first. Coach, I'm sorry, uh, courses.gallup. Let me, let me start that over again. Head out to our website, courses.gallup.com uh, is where those are listed. If you think you want to take it, I think we still have some openings around the summit where those will be available. CliftonStrengthSummit.com offering 15% discounts if you come and do training. Those are filling up fast, Mike. We're pretty excited because we got a whole bunch of people coming for training right before and right after the summit. And we're getting close to filling up the summit. I think we have maybe 200 spots left. So. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to come and join us for the summit, now would be the time to do it. All right, Mike, you got 30 seconds to highlight. Next Monday, you and I are going to kick this thing off. I'm going to yep. dive deep into each one of these questions. I can't wait, by the way. In 30 seconds, give a little preview of uh, of what's coming. Yeah, you bet. So we're going to talk about question number one, featured highlight next Monday. Uh, I know it's expected of me at work. We're going to unpack the trap. We're going to we're going to expose the trap door that so many well-intended managers and organizations fall through, without fail, when they think they've got that mastered, and they don't. And here's the other trick: is we think that once we've got it mastered, we never have to go back and revisit it again. And so we're going to get inside the intricacy, so to speak, of this step one foundational piece, the one that's really going to unlock all the others if we do it right um, on Monday. So stay tuned. No, it'll be great. Jim Harder says, uh, Jim Harder, one of our chief scientists, uh, says, if you don't get question one right, it's really hard to get the rest of them. And uh, and so we're excited to kind of unpack that one and talk about it on Monday. You might be listening to these, uh, the recorded version of them, and they go in order. So we'll see you here in a few minutes as you pop over to session one and, and kind of dig in. And we appreciate it. Mike, thanks for coming out uh, today. I'm excited about the next 12 of these that we get to do. Uh, together. And I, I think there'll be some really valuable uh, information for coaches. If you have feedback for us as well, if there's 
questions, comments. We love to have you in the chat room. We've had some great comments uh, here today in the chat room. Come out and join us live, or you can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. We'll get some information back to you. Mike, thanks again. Hang tight for just one second. Let me close things up. Yeah. We'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available. In this case, I'll say both at the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com, and our Q12 Business Center, q12.gallup.com. Lots of information out there, videos, promotional materials, lots of all those things are out there. If you have some questions, you can kind of dig in there. There's ways to contact us if you want to get more information. We've got experts that will get uh, back to you via email. Um, so head out to either one of those sites. And uh, if, you, like I said, if you have questions, you can send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget, we got a lot of resources available on this on our coaches blog as we talk about this as well, coaching gallup.com. I mentioned the courses page, courses.gallup.com. We'll get you all the information that you need. Oh, we'd love to have you. First time listening to this, we'd love to have you join us in our Gallup webcast Facebook group. Easiest way to do that is uh, just go to facebook.com slash groups slash called to coach. And that was our very first webcast, and that's what we named it. But we'd love to have you join us out there, about 11,000 of us out there talking about this. And let's energize this engagement conversation in our Facebook. It's as important for strengths as it is for engagement, you know, those those two go together like peanut butter and jelly. Speaking of that, it's lunchtime, Mike. Right so on. Let's let's get that done. We appreciate you guys coming out and joining us today. We'll look forward to seeing you on Monday. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.